This is it. Or at least the gist of it. But I can expand on it, I guess. Do you ever have a thing where it's like, I really, really like this thing? It's practically perfect. Fully absorbs me. I can't get enough of it. Just please just inject it straight into my veins. But then someone asks you why that is, and it's like, shit, I don't know. Your mind is completely blank. Like, wait a second. Why do I like this thing so much? It doesn't neatly line up with my main interests. I don't know how to pitch it to others. There aren't particular aspects to it that pop out as its strengths. Maybe I could call it a deconstruction of something, but I'm not even certain what that word really means. So yeah, I guess I don't know. For many, that area is where the simple yet ambiguous work of longtime mangaka Mitsuru Adachi rests. Throughout his entire catalog of manga, there's no shortage of overlap. There's a sport, usually baseball, high school romance, usually with romantic tension between childhood friends, and decently often in the form of some extent of a love triangle, a lot of easygoing slice of life, though often loss of a loved one is in there somewhere as well, some slapstick comedy, a weird looking dog named Punch, and some may argue the same character designs over and over again, even though really, I mean, I, I, Kosair is standard, parting in the center with just a few rough patches sticking out, but Hero's hair parts more unevenly and with more prominent stray strands here on his left side. Tatsuya has a more consistent bangs, only being slightly parted, Keisuke has an even shorter, cleaner cut, and Toma kinda has the Koen hero shape, but messier, with little strands poking out in every direction. Really, they couldn't be more different. Like, how can people say with a straight face that Katsuya and Kazuya are so similar? I mean, just look at their, like, nostrils. Even still, the main pieces of his style are very clear, easily identifiable, and seemingly not that special. The generalities laid out here can be quickly found elsewhere. There isn't anything that outwardly and obviously presents itself as immediately creative and unique in his stories. And yet, with so many of these works, I can pick them up, even one that I've read before, and think, I'll just read a few volumes to refresh my memory on it, you know. Reacquaint myself with the story and pick apart why it worked, just a few volumes, it's all like, oh, okay, I finished it again in a week. For an author who can repeatedly have that effect on me, and I assume countless others because while the English market hasn't embraced him much at all, Adachi is quite popular elsewhere, especially in Japan. He's one of the definitive authors of the 80s and Shonen Sunday in general, alongside Rumiko Takahashi. For a guy that popular, he does a good job hiding why that is, having these big obvious pieces to his style repeat to the point that many think of him as having a recipe or a formula that he follows with each series. You wouldn't think that would work for long. On paper, that would inevitably get old eventually, because if you skim through some of his major works like Touch, H2, Cross Game, what's on the pages won't seem all that unique from each other. You'd end up shaken by the smallest of changes, like, oh my god, the lead woman character in this one is a ponytail. He's really playing fast and loose here. But Adachi balances so many overlapping aspects because there's always more than what's on the pages. His real strength that pulls people in is far less tangible. It's what lays between the lines, between these panels, in the space that he lets his work breathe in more than practically any other author does. He kind of disarms you from expecting much there, because with some of those repeated aspects, like the character designs or the simple punchy humor that doesn't shy away from the fourth wall, he will be extremely direct with those in minor ways. Like jokingly having a character speak in a way that's transparently to get across exposition quickly, or making it clear that some people on the team are just there to fill space. Or, hmm, why did I get this dog and name it Punch? It's almost as if someone made me. He's not gonna beat around the bush, he'll just head straight and give you a wink. And him being so open about some of those aspects to his writing masks the fact that, in the important moments, Adachi is anything but obvious and predictable. His biggest strength is his lack of overtness, letting scenes flow seamlessly, trusting his readers to piece together what his characters are really feeling, always leaving room for the actual nuance of people's realistic emotions. Like the clearest piece to his style that you could easily glance over without seeing what it adds is his tendency to have these panels, often several pages worth in a single chapter, that are just showing different innocuous pieces of the environment. He'll directly joke via his common fourth wall breaks that these are just to fill space so he can meet his deadline, or that he can toss this work over to his assistants. But as always, it's underselling how much of a boon it really is to these chapters. They're firstly gorgeous, whether it's a shot of the sky, trees, school gate, 
or shower faucet. They're all peacefully appealing and fit in to give depth to his art and how it complements his occasionally cartoony character designs and framing. It works in tandem with that, but also with the pace and flow of his story. Every read is predominantly so smooth and relaxing, as you have these notable rest stops between scenes that give you more space than the single panel establishing shot or multiple cut up thin panels that most manga authors will use as transitions instead. Here it lets you keep moving, but kind of rest your eyes before you actually have to focus and start reading again. And that's one of the few cases where how Adachi presents things feels just as much like that of a film director as it does a comic artist. Like he understands the strength specific to his medium. He uses his fair share of page turn reveals, or symmetry within companion pages, and sometimes jokes that are very much in that unchanging shot newspaper comic style. But overall, there isn't any other author where I can so easily picture how this would all be adapted in motion. Already here, you can feel the camera behind these panels, the editing cuts as he pans over parts of the area, the match cuts, the progressive zoom that fills an entire page as he takes his time with a dramatic reveal, or a zoom jump cut being represented by a small panel we focus on being contained within a much larger panel of its surroundings. He'll also often end a moment on a wordless panel that of course adds something to the current scene, but also transitions to the next one in a way where you can imagine the exact point in that action that the cut happens. Like, I remember one where this guy is practicing his batting while speaking vaguely about a friend to a girl. And eventually she asks him, who are you talking about? And the only panel in response before switching to another scene is a shot focusing on his fierce swing of the bat. We, the reader, know who he was talking about already, but his only response being to swing the bat tells us further that he is more frustrated with this person than he is willing to let on. He keeps those feelings held in, only being willing to release them in the slightest within the context of the sport they both play. And also, that's just a cool transition you can picture it in film. You see the bat swing, and right at the end of the whoosh, once it's past its peak velocity, when the blur has just left the shot, smash cut to the next scene. It's a simple, small thing. Like everyone knows the rule of show don't tell. I'm talking about one tiny panel in a 300 plus chapter series. And in general, I'm arguing for the importance of, like, a picture of a sink faucet, you know? But like I said, Adachi isn't overt. His entire deal is stuff not being put into words. To tweak a saying, writing about Adachi is like dancing about architecture. You can't really do it. So to get as close as I can, I have to go into the little things. Otherwise, it's just baseball games and pretty girls. So it is a seemingly minor but ultimately important thing that his flow, despite being contained to static images, feels as smooth as moving pictures. If I really wanted to stretch the film director parallel, I could also excuse the samey character designs as being like someone who usually works with the same actors across several films, but I, I won't push my luck, I guess. His work just has a cinematic nature to it. Not in the more traditional Spielbergian sense, with these large-scale, ambitious, wide-open shots you'd more quickly associate with that idea, but in the just-as-impressive Edward Yang sense of effortlessly capturing the natural view of the world from down here. Being able to consistently feel the camera like that, to me, has been rare in manga. Fujimoto in his one-shots is maybe one of the other exceptions, but even him, like, that could be cheating, given that basically every panel in Goodbye Airy is literally done from the perspective of a character holding a camera. With Adachi, even if it is just him wanting to fill up pages before his editor gets mad, I wouldn't mind if some of these chapters were half-filled with these panels. It's what lets his worlds feel alive. It offers a soothing advantage to his patient flow over other authors who don't allow themselves the space for panels like these, because it seems like the type of thing that would make you lose your reader's attention. It's illustrating the constant, unwavering passage of time. It provides these pages an atmosphere, showing moments of nothing in particular happening, just as would occur anywhere, sometimes. It's the world just breathing, even as two of our characters are having a conversation. And that's a whole other layer to how it works. When these types of panels actually have speech bubbles in them, it can strangely help communicate how exactly the characters absent from that panel are speaking to each other. They belong in a panel like this when lines are being shouted over a distance, or quietly said to oneself, or more uniquely, 
It illustrates to us when something is being said to a person without looking them in the eye. All these ways that words would simply be put out into the air, more so than directly pointed at someone. So that's exactly where the words rest on these pages. This sort of indirectness is key to Adachi's character writing, which is arguably where he shines the most. In no other comic that I've read do I actively think about whether the words are being said while looking each other in the eye or not, much less feel like I consistently have a read on what the answer is without it being objectively illustrated to me. Adachi just gets it. Regardless of whatever tropes he uses, or fourth wall breaks, or silliness, his characters are always so organic. Their true thoughts and feelings are said yet unsaid. They only become clear through almost subconscious actions. Like the scene I highlighted earlier. The swinging of the bat tells you more of what he's feeling than any speech bubble does. That's very representative of his work overall. Characters hide, deny, and lie about their feelings. If you ever see someone actually being vocally straightforward and earnest, there's a good chance it's just to set up a punchline, revealing that they're doing so with ulterior motives. And it's like this all the way down to the very end of each story. The romances don't finish with the pair kissing, saying I love you, and running away together. Even if a single piece of that occurs, it's always too realistically imperfect to not leave you a few different ways to interpret it, wonder what it means, and what it will lead to. It even goes as far as, like, there's a crucial point in Cross Game, where this guy, and I'll be vague, is asked about his perspective on something, and he's going to give an answer, but before doing so, he flat out asks, can I lie? And the other person says, sure. Words are not overly reliable in Adachi's stories. You generally can't take them at face value. Answers given don't reveal as much as the questions asked, or the choices made, or the minorest of actions taken. Lies just act as an easy shield to put in front of yourself, and being able to see through them all and notice the things that point towards the truth is his way of illustrating the genuine care and understanding that his characters have for each other. It works similarly for us as readers in our relationship to the story. Having the space to reasonably interpret what's left out of their thoughts lets us feel like we know these characters better than we would otherwise. Because hearing someone's entire life story does not inherently mean that you truly know them. You feel like you have a real understanding of a person when you're able to, in a way, finish their sentences. These hesitant, roundabout ways of communicating give his characters understated depth below what's just quiet simplicity at first glance. And that's something that he took a while to get to. If you look at his first notable series, Nine, it is very unsubtle. Character motivations are straightforward, a few of the personalities are more over the top in one note, and chapters are consistently reliant on us literally reading what the main character's internal thoughts are, rather than finding other ways to communicate them to us. And all that together, in my opinion, is not that interesting. I was dragging myself to even read half of Nine, 4.5. But within the next few years, the ever-so-humble Adachi realizes the strength in what he doesn't do just as much as what he does do. Like in place of those internal thoughts written out, he decides to have this simple speech bubble with ellipses in it to signify that the character is processing something. And even later in his career, he often doesn't even need to rely on that to get the idea across. It's just in the expressions, in the pacing, in the way panels fit together. It's all these little aspects uniting to fit Adachi's main ethos which is rarely, if ever, throwing a fastball straight down the plate. He instead wants to write in a way where even in response to the minorest events, you are always trying to think through what the characters are thinking. It applies in the actual baseball games too. He handles the action and draws momentum well, building effective tension and stakes in the games that matter. But beyond that and Adachi's general love of the sport, why it fits with him so well is that it essentially hinges on so many wordless conversations with the pitcher. Whether it's the connection between a pitcher and catcher battery, a pitching duel between opposite teams, or the direct face-off between a pitcher and the cleanup hitter, it's all Adachi's bread and butter. These people are having a dialogue while being 60 feet apart and silent. His focus isn't on, like, crazy superhuman sports plays and mind games, where, like, I know that he assumes my instinct is to throw a fastball here, so because of that, I'll switch to a slider, but he knows that I'm aware enough to choose that, so in actuality, I'll switch to a curve, the thought process leading to which he could easily think of as well. So my true move will be to invent a brand new pitch where you stand backwards and only hold the ball with your pinky as you throw. You know, that's not it. The strength is much more in how the ball and the bat speak for these characters. 
as letting a third strike go by doesn't just mean that this guy was too slow for the pitch. That's why classifying his work as sports series never feels like a great way to advertise them. The actual sport in action is not as much of a focus as most other series in that genre. I mean, on a given team, he usually only establishes, on average, maybe like three, four players. Generally the pitcher, the big smart catcher, and probably a cocky comic relief guy. The rest? They're lucky if they even get names. The main exception is H2, where they have the battery and comic relief, who's actually given further depth in this case. But also given that this one's his largest story, and part of it is about building a team from the ground up, there are four other members with their own little arcs building up to them joining, plus the coach and manager. And that's almost a full team, so like, nice job, Adachi. I particularly like these guys, Shima and Otake, who joined basically to sabotage the team and help a guy from another school, but gradually they go from planning the team's demise to thinking, wait, baseball's kinda fun, and oh my god, I, I just hit a home run. Everyone is cheering for me in this whole stadium, this, this feels really good. The baseball games themselves are done the best in H2 as well. I would probably say that about everything with H2, to be fair. It's easily my favorite of his works, and I think it has the most depth to the relationships in it. Like, I'm already impressed enough that Adachi repeatedly pulls off the eye roll worthy trope of love triangles, but here he even makes what's basically a love square work. Like, wh what the hell? That shouldn't be possible, but, uh, yeah. So the baseball aspect is what I can most confidently praise about H2, since you have more games there played against actual characters and not just against, you know, the other guys. Still probably not enough of a focus to comfortably fit in with the other sports series though. And I think being stuck in that in-between spot genre-wise is part of why Adachi's work doesn't catch on with as many audiences. You probably get a lot of people who see it and think, Sports? <laughs> come on, I listen to Weezer. This isn't for me. And then on the other end, people who do come looking for that action could easily read it and think, Hey, what's up with all this time spent doing nothing? Where's all the baseball? And to go back to all that nothing, the use of silence and emptiness is seen in relationships, baseball, and also just general plot points. So often the story is building up tension in one way or another, gearing up for this do or die moment, and when we finally get there, we don't see that moment. We see the build up, and if there's a reveal, it's only of the aftermath. That leaves a blank that usually isn't difficult to fill in yourself, it's just clear that Adachi rarely wants moments where everything is laid out on the table for everyone to see. What in other series would be these big two-page spread images or page-long monologues, he'll either leave it out or camouflage it. Like, he'll often have these really poignant and important lines, but they're just slipped into such innocuous conversations that pass by as normal and don't have their importance emphasized to you. They show up in that lifelike way where only one of the people there is going to remember those words and be affected by it. The rest, even the person who said it, will forget. So you could easily pass through them as well. He, in a way, connects the reader deeper to the story by just treating them how he would another character. In an interview Adachi had with French publisher Le Figaro, there were two particular things he said that relate to this. First, he confirmed that the imagination of his readers is something that he's very dependent on in his writing. And second, he stated that his secondary characters have a fundamental role and are more so allowed to express the feelings of main characters who are not necessarily the most expansive. If you look at the characters in that role, you can so often see them just observing, quietly acknowledging and wondering about the words and actions of our leads. And often, the most direct and reliable statements we get written on the actual page come from those characters piecing together what they've absorbed. So they essentially rest exactly where Adachi wants to place the readers. Not omniscient, not inside any character's head, but close enough to observe the minutia, wonder the implications, and infer. It doesn't feel as much like Adachi is actively hiding stuff from you. He's just, in these moments, trying to place you fully within his story. He really seems to strive for that involvement and connection to the reader which weirdly I would think also ties into the complete other end of his writing with how he gets away with his constant fourth wall breaks, unabashedly shilling for whatever works of his are currently stocked in stores via his self-insert character, making other characters praise him, or directly and transparently defending against the common criticisms thrown at him. 
It's just giving another part of himself to the readers. I specifically remember in a late chapter of H2, the narrator is going on about seasons and the passage of time, as he does quite often. But then as that narrator says time has flown by, Adachi finishes the speech with, Thanks for wasting so much time with me. It's just so sweet. Most authors would save that for interviews, Q&As, or a little blurb at the start of a volume. Here it's squarely in a chapter. You having a role here isn't a secret. It all shows that Adachi trusts you. While he presents his work as a simple, funny, sports-slash-romantic comedy in which the author definitely, by far, does not ever make continuity errors, the main dynamics within it all have realistic nuance. And instead of hammering that home too, he just trusts his audience to read into it themselves. To not gloss over the conversations during the walk to school or while having a drink at the cafe, and to make notice of the time between those moments. He trusts you even to find the clarity in what at first glance seem like very open-ended final chapters. He hides the depth and range of his stories in plain sight, within the surplus of literal and metaphorical space on the pages. That's what differentiates what, from surface level, look very similar to each other. When you directly compare his series, like, one thing I brought up is overlapping across them is the loss of a loved one, death happening without any dramatic effect, and those who keep living having to grapple with that. It's something that occurs in some form in all of his big three baseball series. But while the blanket concept is there, and the main character of each story at least has some shared DNA and similarities in how they're written, each of them in their given circumstances grieves in a completely different way. Blank emptiness, a mixture of depression and anger, masking sadness with humor, no experience is completely shared. The ripples of their differences are felt. These repeated aspects to Adachi's works, the formula, so to speak, are not simply tricks and tools that he whips out to reuse in the same way over and over again. They're just the field of choice that he plays his game on, telling stories where he removes from our view all the grand statements, dramatics, and life-changing moments, to focus on the in-betweens, a place where everything rests on a similar level. The hills and valleys aren't major enough to even divide a story of his up into different arcs. Even after the crucial, high-tense game that dictates whether your team is going to the Koshien or not, the sky isn't too different, the wind blows the same, the walk home isn't any shorter. Tomorrow moves on just like any other day. And still, after all this, that just doesn't sound compelling on paper, but but it, it, it just is. And for a while, I was stuck thinking that maybe that's all the reason there was. Like, bear with me. There are a lot of jokes in The Simpsons that do not make any sense. They're funny, but after a few times, you try to figure out why that is exactly. Reason out how the joke works, what it means, what's the logic. Why did Lenny say his own name twice when introducing himself, Carl and Homer? I'm Lenny. This is Carl and Homer. I'm Lenny. Did he want his name to be both first and last? Did he forget he already said his name? Is he stupid? It doesn't matter. It's just funny. So I thought, maybe Adachi's work is one of those things. Where it just is what it is. The feeling is always there, and there's not a science to that. But through all the time trying to write this video, banging my head against the wall trying to articulate his strengths, I'm pretty sure I figured out what it is about him that ties all these aspects together and makes them work. What it is that puts him above so many others. It's all because 